Viewers of my recent videos will know that I've only just finished setting up the enclosure which is directly behind me and so the most exciting part of getting a new enclosure is still yet to come and that is getting the reptiles that are going to be living in there. Now these reptiles are going to be coming from Harvey and Tom of Celtic Reptile and Amphibian and before we get the animals I really do just want to show you around this incredible facility. Harvey and Tom only keep European species in outdoor enclosures and as they have an aim towards conservation and not just breeding for the pet trade, it makes what they've set up one of the best reptile and amphibian sanctuaries that I personally have seen in the private sector. So in this video we're going to be taking a look around all Harvey's enclosures and in the next part of this tour we will be taking a look around what Tom's got at his share of Celtic reptile and amphibian. Now I hope that you are going to enjoy this as much as I'm enjoying making the video and throughout it do just bear in mind that some of the reptiles that I show you in this video are actually the parents of the ones that I'm going to be getting for here. So with that, let's get straight into it. Hello, we're Hello. Celtic Reptile and Amphibian um, and this is just one of the sites that we've got. Yep, um, Harvey, we'll... Tom. Yeah, and uh, we'll take you around and uh, show you some of the animals. Brilliant. Let's That's have a good. look then. So this is the enclosure um, that we built on one on our YouTube channel, the famous en enclosure. Yeah, I can link that in. Video. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this. How big is it? So this one is 180 by 110, um, and it's separated into two parts. We've got frogs on this side and lizards on here. This is a bit of a Mediterranean setup in here. We've got we've got wall lizards and green lizards, um, and they cohabitate completely fine. There's also midwife toads in here that come out at night, um, and as you can see, rocky, loggy. You want it really well draining, with lots of plants, and we throw in wildflower mix to really flesh it out. Where, um, whereabouts do you source these sorts of animals? So these animals come from a variety of breeders across the UK um, and because of protected species they need to have uh, proper um, legislat legislative captive bred papers to allow us to keep them um, and all the animals are captive bred. Right so in this one we've got a I'll variety of frog species, we've in fact got some pond turtles you might not be able to see them. Over here we've got some Marsh and pool frogs. Yeah, it's the the marsh frogs, the um, pelophylax ridibunda, aren't they? More frogs. Yeah, <laughs> I said marsh. More, I meant more frogs. More frogs. Sorry. Of course, pool frogs and marsh frogs are in the same genus, pelophylax. Yeah. And yeah. Pool frogs are actually the rarest, one of the rarest frogs, aren't they? And these are descendants of, of genuine British pool frogs. Um, so they've got British genes in them. So What's the story to tell there? Oh well, there's, there's a massive story behind that. Um, basically, for a long time there was, there's was been pool frog colonies in Norfolk and, and it was found out through evidence by calls and, and genetic analysis that they're actually native. Uh, because they're distinct, they're part of a northern clade. And it was actually friends of ours who discovered them and then started to preserve them. And but unfortunately, they went extinct before they were recognised as a native species. Just too late. Yeah. So yeah, they've, but they've now been reintroduced uh, using Scandinavian stock. I'll just grab that turtle because it's very inviting. So this is actually a threatened species in Europe, um, seeing massive declines across its range. This is only a young one. European pontil emmys a bit And we might see some larger ones later, Oh, we will yeah. see, we oh, will yeah. see. Um, and it's a gorgeous little one, and this one is last year's. Um, and what we find is people keep them indoors, which is completely fine, uh, but they grow much quicker. We, we like to grow them much more slowly. They just mature better, and one of the things you notice is you get a nice smooth shell when, when you grow them nice and slowly. So what sort of things are they feeding on? So these will feed... Mainly at this age, they're insectivores, so they'll, they'll eat mealworms and crickets and anything that strays into the water. We also give them turtle diet, Zoomed turtle diet, along with chopped prawn, salmon. I mean, they eat be better than, than I do, flipping out, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, was going to say, yeah. I forgot to mention yellow belly toad. I can uh, grab one of those as Beautiful well. toad. If he'll let me. Oh, no. <laughs> Wait there, I've got him. So as you can see, loads of pond weed in here helps to filter the water. The and underside of this. You can see why. 
They're called the Yellow Belly Toad. Oh, wow. Just look at that. Gorgeous. And that's used as a warning signal uh, against predators such as the grass snake, which we'll yeah. show you later. Oh, I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they actually flash that up at the grass snake and uh, to show that they're poisonous. I they think there's a, there's, a, there's a fantastic clip of that on a documentary I watched. Um, there is, called The Secret Life of Snakes. Yes, yeah. Curiosity Stream. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and a wonderful species. But one thing worth to note as well is there's more frogs in here which are a lost native species. So they used to be native until relatively recently, possibly the 15th or 16th century. Uh, there's definitive evidence that they were here during the Saxon period. Um, and it's a species we'd love to see back to the UK because we know it went extinct due to fenland drainage that started uh, lit, uh, when the Romans arrived, really. Um, so we'd, we would love to see them back in the UK yeah, again. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so all of these species, in the future, we plan on doing introductions with rewilding projects to get the numbers of wild populations up and you know this is so important captive breeding is so important because if you don't have captive populations of some of these species and something bad in the wild happens disease or deforestation or buildings building sites coming in you, you're not going to have a back uh, a backdrop of species or animals to fall back on so the th something that you might have heard of is this idea of a concept of the invisible arc but so much of what we do in reptile keeping with exotic species just is not geared towards the invisible arc. I mean, how well are many of the morphs that you are aware of going to survive out in the wild? And when we are adding in recessive traits to different species, leopard geckos, bearded dragons, royal pythons, or ball pythons, whatever you want to call, whatever you want to call them, you are just generating a genetically weak population of organisms that are no longer viable for going out into the wild and so maintaining animals like this in a natural setting where there are no morphs there is no selective breeding for monetary gain or anything like that you're doing really vital work for conservation that is a genuine invisible arc but i think that we do need to genuinely shift as a hobby because as i mentioned on the podcast you know Animal rights groups and, and animal welfare groups are, are making a genuine point in some respects. Um, and, you know, if we think about selective breeding and, and morph breeding, there's really no value other than monetary gain from it. And, and if we can really make the hobby a force for good, then that's a justification for keeping animals in captivity. It's a reason for us to be here rather than just our own entertainment. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And I think as well with morphs is that we get so et up and in our minds that there is just a set number of five popular species or so on and anything beautiful that we see there, that is what we end up keeping and don't look any further. But there are prime examples of just natural beauty where you don't have to tinker about with years and years of rat keeping. If I can and... find it. <laughs> <laughs> so what we've got in here is a couple of different types of toads. So this one is the European green toad, Bophotes viridis, and as you can see, an absolutely stunning species. Um, I've often remarked that if I was to say this came from the Amazon or Costa Rica, you'd probably believe me. Just look at the patterning on that back. Gorgeous species. And a related species that we've also got in here uh, is the Natterjack toad, Britain's rarest toad species. Um, and I'll just try and get one out. And the interesting thing about these this species is they interbreed. We don't really know what the extent of the interbreeding is. I, I don't think it'll be as as, as um, extensive as um, the Pelophinax species, but who knows? It, it could be possible that, um, that these species do interbreed because they often share characteristics. You'll see natterjacks which look like green toads, and then, and then green toads which have the beautiful yellow stripe down the back, which is, of course, indicative of natterjacks. And I just, want, I just want to mention that these natterjacks are the rarest amphibian. I'm going to stress on that point. And they are captive bred. It would be completely illegal to take them right. from the wild. And we have all documentation to prove that. Um, and that's worth mentioning. I mean, if they're captive bred, they are exempt from the Wildlife and Countryside Act. Um, 
and as you can see, now keeping um, am- amphibians in sort of a almost you know they're basically wild except for the box. Do you have any concerns with like outside diseases coming in? So chytrid, for example. Yeah, of course, and and one of the protocols that we do have is um, as Joe as gone through is we sanitize any visitors from collections before they come in and we're, all animals have quarantine of at least a month um, and we wear gloves with with all the animals and one of the things I will stress on um, which is a benefit to outdoor keeping is diseases are way less pro- uh, prolific outdoors because obviously there's space they're, they're more spaced out the animals are so diseases won't spread as well but also because we have this constant variation in temperature, diseases don't thrive as well. So another benefit to keeping animals out. And there is, of course, other things like UV radiation of and course. wind blowing away, exactly. all the different things. So and you know we know with the research recently about coronavirus and the the um, uh, you know people who've been exposed to more UV and got high vitamin levels, uh, high sorry D three levels, they're more immune they are to coronavirus um, and it's a similar case with amphibians and uh, diseases that afflict them. So suppose we're ignoring a little bit the elephant in the room over here and that is that um, all your enclosures are outside. Yeah that's absolutely right. We don't keep anything indoors. The only thing that's indoors are the eggs which are incubating. Um, We do this because it's the most natural healthy way to keep these species. You know the they live in Europe, so they're used to a European climate, and here in the UK, you know, we get that sort of weather that we do in mainland Europe. Um, And it's it's just combating that struggle that I have (laughs) and have to make loads and loads of videos about, which is trying to get the old sunlight over there coming from behind us into a box with a couple of different lamps, which is never really going to work that well. Well, I mean, you just have to look at the fireball in the sky to see that you know we get the real thing um which means that you know we're almost as genuine i still think there's room many a lot of room for improvement but we're as genuine to the wild as possible um and the if you look at the enclosures also the structure is different to some degree of indoor vivaria is that if you had a bulb here it wouldn't actually fill that much of a of a space whereas the sun just beats down on the enclosure. and the animals... It is that true flood exactly. that is just yeah, so yeah. hard to replicate. And the animals have got, you know, if they want to be literally be cooped by the UV, they come out. But then if they need to get away from it, they have to get down. So the, there's a, the wall lizards in here have escape routes down in the, in the log piles and in the rocks to get away from that UV radiation. So talking about lizards baking in the sun, what have we got in here? So this is all native species in here. Um, we've got common lizards, um, we've got sand lizards, and we've got slow worms. And there's a few gre- uh, sorry, common toads, where, which are not in here permanently, they're just in here to be raised up. Um, all the common lizards we have, um, worth to mention, are wild caught, but from building sites or by captures from cats, so rescued animals. Yeah. Um, it's important to stress that um, because because we shouldn't just be going out exactly, grabbing anything yeah, it, and sticking it in boxes. Um, and we have a brilliant breeding group of common lizards that breed every year. We'll show you some of the babies later. Uh, and we also have the UK's rarest lizard in here, which again is captive bred with all the the legal papers needed because again it's a, a, a highly protected species. I'll show you one of the sand lizards. Well, I can show you both actually. I'll show you the male first. So this is the male. He's only young. He actually came from a breeder in Germany. He's not UK stock. And as you can see, he's just what a stunner. gorgeous, I know. The the um he's he's got his green flanks have just started to fade at this time of year. The breeding badges. Of course, yeah. You can see why they call them the Celtic Dragon, because they are just stunning. Um of so course, over, here, over here this is a this is a common lizard, is that's it? That's a common, that's a male, and you can tell it's a male because I often say that the back, the patterns look like they've been drawn on with a sharpie if you compare that to a female. You can find a female. There's a female on that on, on that log there. Yeah, I see exactly Fainty what you mean markings, there. Yeah. So I'm just trying to look for slow worms. Um they're a fossorial species, which means that they live under the ground. And when this debate about do we supply UV to 
to fossorial species we've just seen the answer and it's absolutely 100 percent yes we've just seen one cryptically basking where they expose just a section of their body to the to the sunlight so the fantastic thing about having an enclosure like this with just all this people would call it clutter if it was plastic plants and in a little fish tank but outside it, it's just it is really a section of an environment a section of scrub and these animals that are going about and just going through their day just walking around they have uv exposure so when you've got your royal python or so on that's inside its enclosure indoors in its artificial vivarium just because it is going through that leaf litter like this it doesn't mean that it is perfectly protected from the sun's radiation those slow worms that are going around here and moseying through the leaf litter yes they are a fossorial species but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're completely blocked out from light i mean if that was the case how are we seeing them yeah so sometimes with with cohabbing there's always risks and a recent risk was the male lost his tail uh, to the sand lizards um, it's wow. just something that happens, it's territorial disputes and we try to break it up but we can't obviously be here all the time. But of course with what you're doing here this is a large enclosure exactly. with lots of room, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lots of room to hide, it's see, not a two foot vid. Yeah exactly, you can see the, the thickness of plants, we've got a stone wall in the middle, logs for them to get under, they've got everything they need um, to have a healthy life really. Got a slow worm. There we go. So this is a male. And as you can see, he's got beautiful blue spots. He's just in shed, so he's not perfect. But um, yeah, beautiful male. And you can tell it's a male because they, they have the same colour all around their body, um, except for the belly. Whereas females are two-toned. They have like almost black on the sides and brown on the top. They're like perfectly smooth, aren't they? They're gorgeous. And of course, they're not a snake, are they? No, definitely not. If you if you look at the, you look at the eye, we can get that on macro, but... They, they will often blink and also something different uh, with these is see how high up the vent is this one has lost its tail this was actually another cat rescue but you can see is that from from the uk of course yeah this one's from the uk we've got french and uk in here just to mix up those yeah, lines. yeah, yeah. and um, you can see how high up the vent is where snake is usually much closer to yeah. you know at the end of the tail. But if you head to one of our videos, which is how to build a hibernaculum, we tell you about how you can attract these animals to your garden. So if you are a gardener and you want to bring these wonderful animals into your garden so they can so they can provide this ecosystem service, head to that video. And a perfect example of a snake being outdoors and actually getting the benefits of natural sunlight would be the Escalapian snake. <laughs> this one this one has got a few problems feeding and, and that's one of the downsides with outside is um, animals can be there's slightly less control over animals um, and so you can see he's a bit thin you can see his, his spine there so we're working on that at the moment um, and this is a snake that's been with us for a year and a half now um, and we're slowly getting there because this is actually wild so there's a population of Escalapian snakes in London and this one got hit by a bike and then eaten by a rat. So really wow. interesting story. Um, and ever since has, has, has come to us. He ate yesterday actually, which is brilliant. Um, but for the first full year, didn't even take any interest in food. So again, it's all about, you know, trying to work with these animals. So we, we're trying to get that weight back on him now. But Yeah, of course, because obviously it's not just a case of bang them all outside and exactly. jobs are good and you've yeah, actually yeah, got to yeah. do some some real thinking and research yeah, yeah, into yeah. this so um so yeah he's a gorgeous snake um and and you can see with the escalapian snakes that they're, they're an all all-terrain vehicle they'll bury down in the soil but then also climb up into the vegetation and you can see we've got birch trees and grapevines we've even got birds nests and they'll they'll curl up and sit on the birds nests we've got four in here and the other ones eat well and we actually put the food on the birds' nests and they come out and eat, eat it. And in the wild, they'll actually eat eggs, you know, swallow them whole, which is incredible. Yeah, like I, I fed a, uh, a quail egg yes. to yeah, my yeah, corn yeah, snake yeah, yeah, earlier yeah. in the year and he took that no bother. Yeah. And uh, you can see they're a gorgeous, gorgeous snake. But again, a species which is rather like a corn snake. So a great alternative to a corn snake would be an Escalapian snake. Um, Although, and, it's, I suppose, on that note, we've, we must mention that Whereas an Escalapian is 
a European species and will do well in the British climate. Yeah, 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 yeah. A corn snake yeah. through the winter probably wouldn't do probably. so well. You say probably. probably. Maybe, in a, maybe in a greenhouse, I think there's a possible chance. But again, we, I, can't, I can't say definitely. I've never tried a corn snake outdoors. I know people who kept them in the summer outdoors, um, but these species do perfectly fine, 365. Um, and they'll bury down in the winter into the soil. Um, absolutely incredible species. The Romans actually love this species because they thought it was immortal because um, it would hibernate and then emerge completely unfazed by the winter and they thought that it was healing itself and bringing itself back from the dead. And so of an course, that uh, link, link with the Romans, that weirdly spelt name that is not nice to pronounce on your first go, <laughs> that's uh, Aesculapius, the Roman god of exactly. medicine. Or yeah, healing, if medicine. I'm not and, and threatened in the wild again. Um, so worth preserving. So at the edges of its range, such as in Germany, uh, it's, it's critically endangered. So captive breeding, again, will help reinforce those wild populations, both as an educational animal and as a conservation animal. And so we've got another example of a snake species in here, if we can find it. This is in quarantine, and this is a grass snake. This is a native species. Here you go. Gorgeous species. Wow. So, uh, Natrix helvetica is the name, and the genus Natrix is actually derived from the word natare, which means to swim, and which adequately describes their habitat. They're a, an aquatic species because they eat amphibians, but also I think they eat a lot of fish because we feed them fish, and they seem to love it. Um, yeah. And as you can see, a really active, gorgeous species with that beautiful collar, and you should never get them mixed up with the... The other native species of snake, if you see that collar, it's a grass snake. Yeah, because um, of course, as, as well as grass snakes in the UK, we've got adders and uh, Coronella ostriaca, yeah. which is the smooth. smooth snake, yes. And the, the thing about grass snakes is, as you can see, it's got these bars that go down the, the length of the body. Gorgeous species, and it was actually reclassified from the common grass snake to the barred grass snake. Um, and it was actually, there was a bit of hysteria. Do we have a fourth species? No, we don't. It's just they've been reclassified. But a gorgeous animal. Absolutely now, in, gorgeous. Now, in terms of ecological niche, you could almost say that these are like the European garter snake in a way. Exactly, yeah. European garter snake is, is what, I, what I usually call them. Um, Although, of course, jumping about geographical locations with garter snakes, we've got to say that things like from equatorial species, you know, your boas and pythons, just making setups like this is not going to work all year round because obviously we do have yeah, yeah. that horrible thing called the winter. <laughs> well, as you can see, you know, you, uh, these animals are kept outside and a very small minority of animals can be kept outside. Um, and it's not something you should just do, you know, just throw a boa outside in an enclosure. That does not work. As you can see, a native species adapted for our climate and other species which have either been introduced to the UK or live relatively near to the UK um, and you know we need to be we really do need to stress on the point that you can't be throwing any old species right. outside um, we you have to do a thorough amount of research into keeping these animals and, and likewise these animals can live indoors you know uh, but now, again, now a lot of you say they throw them outside but what have you actually done for an enclosure we drill holes into the bottom. Right. And we add sometimes a layer of gravel just to aid with the yeah. damage. And obviously these holes are too small for the, the grass snakes to escape through, so that's not an issue. And we also we have the option where we cut out the lid and put a, a mesh on, so obviously they can't escape. But this means that they get natural UV directly. There's no obstruction from the plastic. So really... What we're talking about here is an enclosure where the animals have everything they need, it's naturalistic, they've got UV, they've got better lighting than any of my animals do by yeah. far, but that is probably cheaper oh, than yeah. a rack setup. This, this, this is affordable for anyone. I mean, in that you've, just, you've got the rub, which costs maybe maximum 20 quid, uh, plants maybe maximum 10 pounds or if you just dig up weeds you've got them exactly. to free exactly. soil free leaves free bark free as long as you sterilize it and, and what have you take the proper precautions done obviously when these 
have finished the quarantine, they'll go into a larger enclosure with a more permanent setup. But for for quarantining for babies, this these rub setups are just perfect. So babies, do you have any babies at the moment? Yeah, so here we've actually got baby common lizards. Wow. Or viviparous lizards, they're also called. Yeah, the name the name common sort of takes away from them a bit, but they are absolute yeah. little stunners. Yeah, the, the common name doesn't really adhere to their uh, population. There isn't many common lizards about anymore, unfortunately. No, they're so they're so sparse. I mean, yeah. you get them over a wide area, but the populations are never dense anymore. No. So we've got more in here, have we? Yeah, we've got some baby green lizards now. These are very shy, and so we might struggle to see them. Yeah, unfortunately, but they are in there. I assure you. <laughs> yeah. Do we have any adults? Like adult, the breeding stuff. Yeah, adult green lizards. So they these will be housed in the greenhouse over there. And they are stunning species. Yeah. Yeah. Should we go in and have a look? Yeah, yeah. Go on, you go first, Joe. Okie dokie. So there's a male there, poking his head oh, out. Oh wow. He's the biggest chicken of the group. He's the largest, most beautiful male I've ever seen of a green lizard, yet he's the biggest chicken ever. Um, and you can see the difference between the male and female. female it's it's really quite striking, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. Male, much a thicker head, bull-like, um, very heavy set, yet the female a bit more dainty. And you can see the double lines that run down that female's back is always an indication that it's a female. The male's rarely, if ever, have that. And that gives rise to the specific name, of course, bilineata. Exactly, exactly. A gorgeous species, absolutely fabulous species. Produce eggs for us um, every year. So, with everything being raised outdoors, that's one of our, the things that we do as a company that we've that we always assure we also raise our amphibians outdoors like we do with the green lizards in here we've got european tree frogs um, which we'll show you a bit later and you can see they're massive and this is one of the benefits they truly are the biggest yeah. tadpoles i have ever seen well we'll just show you some <laughs> even bigger ones in a minute and the bigger the tadpole the better because it means you get a bigger froglet so a more healthy animal and again another benefit to keeping outdoors but again no filter Lots of plants in there. The animals crack on. We give them a bit of food now and again. A lot of natural food. Yeah, these yeah. are these like a. I know. I think the common frog tadpoles. They sort of start off on a more herbivorous diet, feeding on the yeah, algae yeah. which is growing well, in there. Do these the same? Yeah, very much the same. One of the, the the things that these do eat is pollen, and because we're outdoors, we get the pollen off the trees, into the water in the enclosure, and they eat the pollen. Again, natural diet. Yeah, so in captivity, people these days are getting more and more excited with bee pollen and adding bee pollen as supplements to food. But what people don't realise as well is that outside, where there are natural flowers, there's just pollen floating around on the air everywhere and landing on every surface. So everything an animal that is kept outdoors is eating, that has also been outside, is already covered in pollen. It's basically pre-dusted in just a completely natural way. And obviously you aren't having to burgle the bees to get it. So I didn't have a clue about the pollen actually. Um, really? It really surprises me. Uh, but And that relates to a point that we are often stress is that we do things we don't know we're doing if that makes sense. So an example would be recently we've looked into airflow. Airflow is something that you know naturally happens in and out of the enclosures. It prevents disease because it blows away pathogens and it also just helps to freshen up the enclosure. And that can be seen as a drawback. You know, we are providing things that, that we don't know we're providing. Yeah. But at the same time, that al allows people like Joe, who have indoor setups, to learn things from these animals, which are practically living very wild. It's basically just taking notes on what are they doing here, what is actually occurring, and how do I get this into my setups, and what exactly what biologically does it have a significance with? Yeah, exactly. And and I think that you know, with keeping outdoors, if we can be, if we can start. You know, one of the things we're thinking about is start recording temperatures, humidity levels, wind speed. We can really then try and help, you know, convert that in to indoor keeping. So that's a, a uh, midwife tadpole. And the that tadpoles, is a huge tadpole. Yeah, they actually get bigger than the adult toads, which is pretty cool. 
um, a wonderful species to keep. These are the Betic midwife toad and these are a rare endangered species in the wild so a species that we're breeding for their conservation value. Once again the invisible arc but executed properly. Yeah. So what have we got here? So these are oscillated skinks and you know they're a inexpensive species to yeah, buy. Yeah it's a familiar name. Yeah and yet not many people actually keep them outside unfortunately yet they in a British climate do perfectly fine if I can find one <laughs> and um, it's probably because there you go in the Mediterranean wow. they have extremes of temperatures so they'll experience highs but also lows in temperature and you can see they're absolutely lovely species really yeah. well natured these are only younger I should stress um, and these are from Raptor Exotics Falconry these are from a, a public collection and really cool little things they are yeah and keep outside completely fine again in in one of these sort of rub enclosures this is not the final enclosure i'll stress i think we may think about cohabbing them with the green lizards depends on space but but yeah another wonderful species that we uh, keep here awesome one of the criticisms that we have here at celtic is that outdoor keeping is a relatively new way of keeping animals but the tortoises as uh, this horse fell, the tortoise here will show you, they have been kept outdoors since the 1890s. And now if that's new to you, I don't know what is. Well yeah, it's like just people typically think of two enclosures for tortoises almost, you know, you one indoors for terrible weather and one outdoors for just the rest of the time. Exactly. But, you know, why not extend that to more species? Yeah, you know, these tortoises are perfectly adapted to living outdoors and we've known this hobbyists have known this for over a hundred years now and what's quite shocking is they've only just started realizing this for lizards and frogs well thank you very much for having me over no worries You're great Absolutely brilliant. I know, so uh, I don't think we're done yet, are we? No, not, not at all. Not even halfway. <laughs> so next up, we're gonna next video, we'll roll over to Tom's and we'll see what Tom's got over at his place. So for now, this has been Celtic Reptile and Amphibian, yeah. and I've been JTB Reptile teaching you how to pollinate your sample. So I'll see you in the next one when we're over at Tom's. Bye guys. <laughs>